Welcome to episode 13 of Secrets of the Universe, Walking the Conscious Path with Steve Hassenberg. This episode is titled The Path of Enlightenment. So Steve, probably the best question to ask is what happened to the Buddha after he obtained his own enlightenment? Um, if you remember on video four, the, na the name of video four was uh, The Buddha's Last Fear. And I'm just going to review that a little bit to take people into the story because it's a gorgeous story. So if you remember, Buddha was sitting under the Bodhi tree and he made a vow. And the vow was that I'm going to sit under this tree and either I'm going to attain enlightenment or I'm going to die. And at that point, everything that he had pushed away in his fears, in his jealousies, in his greed, in his desires, came back to him. And they, they do this beautifully. It's a metaphor of weather. So there's lightning and thunder and hail and sleet. And the Buddha sits through that without moving because he's in a state that, in a sense, uh, is beyond the world. At the end of this, Mara comes. Mara in, uh, in Hinduism is a demon. Uh, a female, sometimes even a female goddess, but Mara represents death. And Mara brought her entire army, and Buddha was sitting on, under the tree, and the army was surrounding him at a distance, probably a hundred feet. They took out their arrows out of their quivers, put them in their bows, and they lit the arrows. And all the arrows landed around the Buddha, and as they landed, they bloomed into flowers. <laughs> that was representative of his state of consciousness, that he was free from the material world, and in essence, he was free from death. But Mara had something up her <laughs> nefarious sleeve, and that was she had three beautiful daughters. Mm -hmm. And the three beautiful daughters came in front of, that was the beginning of the Me Too movement. <laughs> the, three, the three daughters came in front of the Buddha and started to disrobe. Now one daughter was named attachment, one daughter was named aversion, and the other daughter was named illusion or maya. They, you know that word, right. maya is illusion. The Buddha sat through that as well attained his final liberation. This story goes on in a beautiful way. What we remember from video four is that the Buddha sat there for a long time. No water, no food. And so when he was finished with this experience, even though he had attained what he had looked for his whole life, which was eternity and timelessness, he was near death. He stumbled out of the forest and he was walking down a road and he fell into a ditch face first. This is in the old Pali texts, which I talked about last time, mm -hmm. which go back about 2,500 years. This is very accurate in terms of what is remembered and had been written about him. He fell into a ditch and he was dying. And right before he died, this ox herder uh, an ox, they use oxes, oxen in India uh, for plowing. And this young 10 year old ox herder saw him in the ditch. Didn't know who he was, could be any old guy. And ran back, he saw this man dying, ran back and got ox milk and started feeding the Buddha. And so this little boy revived the Buddha and the Buddha spent the next six months giving all of his discourses, the beginning of the discourses, to children. All of the ten-year-olds came, and I just love the story so much. Right. That's how it all began. And the other piece of it, which is so interesting, is ten years later, that ox herder came to Buddha's ashram. Buddha had become this illustrious guru by that time, was enlightening people. And the ox herder came to Buddha's ashram and said, I want, to be a, I want to be ordained as a monk. Now, 
No outcasts were ever ordained as monks. Monks were the aristocracy. Buddha ordained him and he became a monk. The Vedic priests were very angry about this. And many things transpired after that in order to take down the Buddha. He ordained the first woman 2,500 years ago. Wow. And he ordained the first outcast. So I wanted to begin with that story because it's the story about attachment mm -hmm. and aversion, which we want to talk about today. So we are attached to many things, family members, money, cars. Especially money. Especially money. Especially power. So how do we identify what we are attached to or what adversities we have, what we're adverse to, and find our own path? So the perfect question that you're asking because what I wanted to do during this video was talk to people about the obstacles in their way. There are a lot of people on the spiritual path. Most of the people watching the series are on the spiritual path. And I wanted to give them a sense both of what the Buddha went through facing himself. There's no way that we can attain enlightenment or higher states of consciousness without facing ourselves directly. And that's very, very painful. So I'll come back to that. I want to go into what happened to me on my spiritual path, because I think that will give a very pragmatic idea to the people watching about what they can expect. I, the reason I got into meditation, and that was, I was about uh, 19 or 20 years old, and the reason I, star I started yoga first, and then I got into Transcendental Meditation by Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. And the reason I did that was I was escaping the pain of my childhood. Um, I, I did it first through drugs for about three years when I was going to college in New York. And during that time I realized that the drugs weren't going to take me to where I wanted to go. I wanted freedom and I wanted more joy and I wanted more happiness. And so at that time what I did was that I started Transcendental Meditation. And then I went to these courses in Europe with Maharishi where I meditated for eight or ten hours a day. Amazing. Did yoga, did something called pranayama which is breathing, did fasting for two weeks at different intervals silence at different intervals, and I would go into extraordinary states of consciousness. I would talk to Indian gods and Ganesh and all kinds of things would happen to me. And then I would get home and I'd feel wonderful, and after a week I'd plunge into depression. So and you were still with your parents at this point? I lived with my parents. Mm -hmm. I was probably 21. I was finishing Rutgers University. And I didn't understand it. I thought there was something wrong with me. And I'd go back to one of these courses again, and I'd be in these extraordinary highs. And I thought, I am invincible. And I would get home and somebody would say something, and they'd go, what are you talking about? So the whole thing would change until I realized that there were energies, there were patterns in me, there was negativity, emotional patterns of negativity in me pain from my childhood that I was running away from and not facing adequately. And so I made that a decision because I wanted this enlightenment so much that I would even go to psychotherapy for it. This was before I was a therapist, right? And so I went to psychotherapy and I began this process of figuring out my childhood. How that means you didn't just think of running away, just escaping? The I wanted to. Completely. I didn't have enough money. Mm, yeah. <laughs> That's the problem. If you're going to be in Europe, you need enough money. I'd make enough money, go to Europe, get very high, come home, go into depression. <laughs> it was this whole thing that was going on. So going back to how do we find things? So how do we identify what we're connected to, like really on a deep level? Because on a superficial level, it's very easy. Right. But to really get to know yourself and right. really dig down, well, there are many. That, that's that's yeah, that's quite a challenge for most people, especially well, while life is going on right. at the same time. It's true. So people want to 
experience more joy. I don't know anyone who doesn't want to experience more joy. Happiness. Other people want to experience the heights of spirituality. They want to experience what's called timelessness. They want to have life be more thrilling, more of an adventure and not so boring. So, as we've said in the other videos, there are many roads to do that. One road that I'm talking about today that the Buddha discovered out of his ordeal was the pathway of mindfulness. The pathway of mindfulness, the pathway of meditation, even sometimes the pathway of standing on a mountain or playing a musical instrument or doing a painting, allows us to step back. It's when we step back into a state of silence or quietness. The greatest inhibitor for the spiritual path is the noise of the mind, mm -hmm. okay? We talked about it moons ago, but I said from research, we have nearly 100,000 thoughts a day this is like 17 radio channels playing simultaneously. And we're trying to pick and choose where something comes in with which we're very attached to mm -hmm. and it pulls us. We're pulled by some, maybe a loss of a love. Maybe it happened two years ago, but we're pulled by it and remember the goodness of it. And then we remember the pain of it and we can't get off it. And if that goes on too long, people come to my office. That's how I make my money, right? And then I have to teach them to be mindful. So the Buddha, mindfulness began the day the Buddha, right before he attained enlightenment, because his jealousy was coming, his fear was coming, his urges, his drives, his dissatisfaction, and he sat. He sat apart from it and he was able to watch it. And this is what mindfulness is. It's a beginning of an understanding where you watch what's coming through without reaction. And that's possible for, for any person? Yes, as you know, I mean, mindfulness is very big right now. Mm -hmm. And so many people, which is a godsend, are practicing mindfulness. I don't think they know the real meaning of it, though. I mean, they it's kind of a, it's a commercial brand almost now where That's it just true. means, hey, instant happiness. Come here, do this course. <laughs> right. Easy. It's, it's true. Yeah. It is. <laughs> That's how everything gets branded now. So we're talking about the origin. We're talking about the true meaning of it. And the true meaning of it started with the Buddha. He didn't know he was practicing mindfulness, right? He wasn't in a yoga studio. He sat there and he was able through his own efforts to step back far enough not to be at the mercy of his thoughts and his feelings. And he developed that to such an extent that he sat through death itself, that death became an illusion, that he became so alive that death didn't exist anymore. And what the Buddha means is being awake. That's what the word means. So I um, hope I'm answering your question. So on the, this is called the, th the third path right, or the middle path in Buddhism. On the right side is attachment. On the left side is aversion. Aversion means we deny things. We don't want to hear them. I start thinking about my mother and I push it away. Or over here I'm clinging to an old love and I pull it in. And these two poles, what the Buddha said later on, keep the world spinning. They keep the world alive. They keep us in the material thought feeling cycle where we never really experience our true self. Which leads back to that one question. How, how is it, and is it meditation that gets us in, in, into that middle ground, into that third way, because those, those forces are so incredibly they're powerful so, and they're constant. And that's why it's so difficult to attain liberation or enlightenment. Huh? These two pull us, these two in a way make the world go round. What I have to have, 
the money, the cars, the woman, the power. We're living in a time when power right. is really the prime motivator for so many people. The social media image. Right? Yeah. And what a Jung, driving force. And what yeah. Carl Jung says about power, so cool. He says that power is a, uh, a lower form of love, that if you don't have love, you vie for power. Love exists, we've talked about it through the entire series, inside of us. And so, how do we do it? Again, mindfulness pulls, uh, we begin to pull back. Meditation, we begin to pull back. Being on a mountaintop, you're overtaken with the beauty and what happens is you stop thinking. If we weren't thinking, so much, if we could even take a hundred thousand thoughts and bring them to twenty thousand thoughts, most people would be at a state of great peace. So Buddha's talking about overcoming the thoughts and feelings that keep us bound to the material world. So for a person who, they might hate their boss, so there's the adverse area, they, they don't have enough money to pay maybe all the bills, so right. There's the desire to earn more money. They want to find that third way. Right. What is a practical way that they can do that? Start to meditate. I, you can't really do it. I, I've tried so many different methods. Unless you have a dedication to meditation, which takes you into that still place, the still place in the body creates the still place in the mind. When we have more stillness, there's where the witness comes. There's where the stepping back is. And in the stepping back, you have more equanimity. Then when you have more equanimity, you want more. <laughs> right. And it, it, it motivates itself for more and more peace. So the only thing that I found, I mean, there are chanting methods, there are sitting methods, Yoga is helpful, but yoga without meditation isn't as helpful. Yoga is wonderful. I do it every day, and I've done it since I was 22. Yoga is incredible for the body, and it does calm the mind down when you do it, absolutely. But to keep the mind calm and still when you're in activity is the real gift of meditating or practicing mindfulness for any length of time. So how, as a lesson, how is when you were a kid and you mm -hmm. were discovering this and, and you found your path yeah. to meditating, how mm -hmm. did you do it and is that something that other people can do for themselves? Yes. I mean, I was, I was driven uh, early on because the first video you and I ever did mm -hmm. was about my out-of-body experience at YMCA camp in northern New Jersey. That experience blew me open. I didn't understand it, but I realized there was more to life than what I was experiencing. I knew that I was an eternal being at 12 years old. I didn't, I did. And then the other one happened at 22, and I knew for certain that I was a spiritual being having a human experience. So that drove me. I had more drive than most people, but meditation, yoga, mindfulness becoming very, very popular. And that is the pathway to recovering, to reconnecting with our eternal self, with our soul, with our essence. So the best thing someone can do is find a local class. Just stop. Insight meditation, Buddhist meditation is wonderful. Tibetan meditation in LA, wherever you are in the world, in New Zealand, <laughs> I'm sure they have Buddhist practices. Yeah, Transcendental yeah. meditation is wonderful. Vedic meditation is wonderful. All of these things will make life more worthwhile. So the reason people come to me to learn to meditate, everybody wants more meaning. Everybody wants more personal value. Everybody wants more personal expression. This is how you open it up. The capacity is here. We don't have the way, we do have the way, but people haven't utilized those means to get there. What do we have in the next episode, episode 14? The next episode is gonna be grand. 
Um, it's going to be called the heroic journey, adversaries and adversity. And um, this episode kind of follows a path that Joseph Campbell, the great mythologist wrote about in a book called The Hero with a Thousand Faces. And this is an understanding of the obstacles that we have to overcome and how we're called by the universe to overcome them, even though we don't necessarily want to because... Or know it. Or know that we yeah. are because people, the human beings want pleasure. They don't want pain. So we go toward pleasure. This is about facing the obstacles, facing the ordeal, moving through it and obtaining new life. Right. So the next one is episode 14. Thank you for watching episode 13 of Secrets of the Universe, Walking the Conscious Path with Steve Hassenberg. I'm Greg Agnew.